members and friends to our today's uh, PCS IBS seminar. It is a great pleasure to have with us today Professor Henning Schomerus from Lancaster University in UK. And uh, our scientific host today is Sergei, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our PCS uh, seminar series. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Henning Schumerus uh, with us today, who is visiting for, uh, I think, two months at uh, our center. Uh, so let me see a few things about uh, Henning. Uh, he did his uh, uh, master's in physics or diploma. Uh, he became diploma physicist in 1993 at the University of Stuttgart, uh, and there he was working with Professor Uli Weiss, I think, mm -hmm. his first name. And then he moved uh, uh, to the Riken in Baku, Shi in Japan uh, from 93 to 94. And this is amazingly the time when we met first time. And I completely forgot, but he reminded me uh, that uh, we had some nice chats there during a conference in Tokyo. And uh, after that, uh, we again, uh, our classes again. Uh, split and he moved to then to the University of Essen, where he was a PhD student with Fritz Hacke. And he finished his PhD in 97. From there, he moved uh, to Leiden University in the Netherlands uh, to work with uh, Professor Benacker. And uh, then uh, our, again, our path is crossed when he came to the PKS in Dresden, uh, where he was a junior research group leader from 2000 to 2005. And then uh, again, our path is split, and we moved uh, to Lancaster University, which was not so far uh, at that time, at least, and uh, where he became a reader first, and then moved uh, the ranks up and became full professor uh, in condensed matter theory. Uh, and he is there since. He has a lot of uh, other interesting uh, uh, qualifications and, and other things one can see. He has, he's very active in. Uh, variety of um, systems. I just copied this from his web page. He works on photonic systems, mesoscopic systems, interacting systems, quantum and atomic optical systems, quantum dynamical systems, and classical dynamical systems. There are lots of concepts he's following and there are lots of methods he's using. And he has lots of publications, which you can find in particular also on Google Scholar. And uh, he, um, uh, will speak today to us about the physical limits of uh, non emission and non reciprocal devices. Ending the floor is yours. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you, Sergei, uh, for the very, very kind introduction and uh, also for giving me the opportunity to be here. So it's really, really wonderful. It's uh, been close to three weeks now, and I really enjoyed every single minute. Uh, lots of interesting. Discussions, scientific discussions, nice chats over lunch. And uh, yeah, the, the whole environment in here is really fantastic. So what I'm going to talk to you, and I should thank especially also all the technical support, mm -hmm. not just for this talk, also for getting me here with the visa. I should not remember, uh, forget this. Um, many, many different interactions <laughs> and many people involved to get me. So what I'm going to talk you, uh, to you about today is, um, has, is flowing out of research over the last 10 years or so. Um, Sergei mentioned a number of interests. Uh, a lot of them are essentially just like solving the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> it sounds a little bit more than that if you are more creative. But um, um, obviously, there are lots of analogs in this in the classical world, and um, you quickly then encounter that people can do very nice experiments in the classical world, especially in photonic systems. And then you also quickly discover that they actually don't behave like the, the Schrodinger equation that you are familiar with, and that there are other properties, and they make these systems even more interesting. And so this is sort of an explanation almost of some of the terms that appear here. But what this means in reality is that you, for instance, then discover some interesting ways to build a laser and come up with interesting concepts maybe to also build a sensor. And so I'm going to try to give you an idea of um, how these different concepts play together. Okay, I start with a very, very brief introduction of, um, of some of the background um, just to 
I try to collect a few people who might have no interest whatsoever in this subject. Okay. So, and I sat out with something which I found terribly boring when I was a student. Um, and people told um, me all the kind of dirt and horrible things that can happen in the crystal. The crystals themselves with their symmetries is something that I didn't like at the time, anyways. And then you can have even crystals which are not particularly perfect because, for instance, you have a dislocation some kind of a plane that you force into the system. Okay, the interesting thing is that here you maybe have little plaquettes with um, four vertices, like a square or a rectangle, and then here you have something else, and something with five um, vertices. And then if you try to move this thing around, maybe you are just a mathematician and redefine what your links are, you find that you cannot get rid of this so to speak. And this actually has a topological explanation. So if you think about the position of the atoms as an order parameter, which is kind of on a torus, because you can translate the system into different directions by, uh, by the lattice constant, and then you get back to something which is just the same crystal if it would be infinitely large. So you have a, a kind of a torus, and then you think of what happens if you move, oops, this has not changed away from the pointer to something else. No, that's still a pointer. Uh, okay, now it's a pointer again. There is uh, a little bit of thinking, and you better do this with closed eyes at some point when you uh, um, meditate to figure out what this picture means. Okay, and now it's going to interesting. Um, but essentially, these kind of defects, they can be translated into loops in the space of your order parameter that cannot be contracted. Okay, so if you just uh, think about uh, the adiabatic transformations of these systems, it's something that you cannot get. So you have these topological localized um, features in a crystal, and it somehow has to do something with the fact that a crystal is somehow related to a torus. Then you have other systems which have other defects, for instance, in the metric uh, liquid. Here you have rod-like little molecules. They are like um, little pointers, but they don't have a sense of direction. So if you go around the system adiabatically and just follow these, uh, these links, and then you go around, well, they have turned themselves onto the head, but it's still a smooth structure. All the energy, all of this here doesn't cost any energy because locally this just looks like a perfect system. And only some extra energy that you require um, to create this uh, in here. But again, this is something that you can't get easily rid of. And now the reason is that um, because of the nature of this system, these rod-like um, molecules, they don't have a sense of direction. Try from here. Okay, but then I'm in the way of everybody. But let me switch to the region, okay? Uh, it's much easier. So um, this is now on the, say, the, this, the semisphere, okay? Like the northern hemisphere, if you like. And um, the dislocation or this defect uh, corresponds to a path that goes from here to here. And now if you try to get rid of this, mathematically, this would mean to try to connect this point to this point and then contract it into a loop, say to the North Pole. But once you try to move this one into this direction, this is just going to run away because it's the same point. And so this is, again, one way to understand that these things are kind of progress. And if you were to do the same thing onto a sphere, well, every loop there you can actually contract. So such a type of defect should not exist. Um, such a point defect should not exist if you do it with a magnet. But um, then you could think of more complicated structures like skirmions, and there were some talks about skirmions just um, the other day. So yeah, it becomes mathematically more rich if you then think of more extended structures. So now it happens that you can also do the very same games on the, the, the block space in the Muriel zone, which is a natural torus, but the thing that you define there is somehow related to wave functions. And for instance, you can write down um, Hamiltonian. Say if it's a block Hamiltonian, which is a two by two matrix, you can decompose it into the Pauli matrices and can define the vector. This vector would be a three-dimensional vector in the real space. Because your Hamiltonian has to be Hamitian, it can have only real components. And so it's living on this block sphere. 
And from there, you can then find some interesting topology. In particular, you find that this vector is actually not in this on this sphere, it's actually in the ball. If it vanishes, then you have a collapse or a band crossing. And then you can make uh, topology based on this. For instance, you can introduce a churn number depending on how this thing winds as you go through the river and so on. And um, what people then discovered is that this, for instance, translates into the whole conductivity. This churn number just appears if you make a calculation in the Kubo response formalism for a two dimensional system. And, uh, you will find a constraint um, in these systems, and then you can work out that um, the whole conductance itself is related to this number. So, can I ask you a well, question? Yeah, uh, to be sure if I understand correctly, that is there a dimension that uh, you have in mind uh, in, in, in this uh, explanation? That, for example, in two dimensions. It is important in how many dimensions you do this. Um, but um, this is just the introduction. So this would particularly apply to a two-dimensional system. In higher dimensional systems, you need to play around with your symmetries to make sure that you get topological features, or you have to take the spin electronic features. And then there's a whole table which tells you how you can combine dimensions and symmetries in order to get more source of Unfortunately, this is just introduction, and we don't need this very deep mathematical features. We will find something which is more uh, of a qualitative nature from just breaking one of the fundamental assumptions already on this slide, which is that our Hamiltonian is emission. <laughs> and this has much more direct and uh, interesting consequences for the present study. Thank you. Okay, so this, uh, what I just told you, is essentially gives you, for instance, a topological explanation of the robustness that you witnessed in the quantum Hall effect, where you have these plateaus in which the Hall conductance or resistance, depending on how you define it, is, uh, is takes very discrete values in terms of units or fundamental constants. And um, yeah, you can then come up with explanations that tell you why this is so robust. And, uh, there are other things important in there. For instance, the Pauli principle, things that we could also violate, but um, let's start with one of the violations at one point and then let's think about the other complications a little bit later. But it's the beginning of a longer story uh, leading to also this Nobel Prize here, which has some other topological features in it. But what the nice thing is that uh, what is interesting for us is that all these concepts, because they are of a very generic mathematical nature, they nicely transfer to other settings. And so one setting which uh, has seen a lot of activity is to replicate these effects in photonic systems. Well, the first goal of this field was to just take the effects that we know from the electronic systems and carry them over as closely as possible, let's say one to one onto the photonic platform, and then to obtain something like edge transport in uh, silicon photonics where you have little resonators that you have um, featured in such a way that you enforce some unidirectional transport. It's really engineered. It's not the same symmetries that you would have on an electronic system because you have a magnetic field, but you just build these resonators so that the evanescent coupling means that it's easy for a photon to jump from here to here, but um, not to go in one arm and then move in the opposite direction, okay? So it's just a matter of engineering to make sure that two different propagation sectors are essentially decoupled. And then if you study one of them, you will find unidirectional transport just as a function of the topology of these resonators. And then it doesn't matter anymore where you put them. Okay. Um, but there is no fermacy and uh, it's photons and you lose some of them and you scatter in all sorts of directions um, and your system might become nonlinear. So clearly the systems are also very different from what um, you have on the electronic platform. But nonetheless, you can make these translations. And you can also do it, um, for instance, as transferring it to mechanical systems. You could even argue that the story started there 150 years ago with Maxwell who wrote down beautiful equations and papers counting degrees of freedom and, um, and constraints, which um, structural engineers, for instance, use to explain why you can ride a bicycle. 
because it has lots of components, but they are coupled in a way that you have enough degrees of freedom to kind of stay elevated in the two dimensional plane. Well, this system here is made out of different types of levers and connectors. There's essentially one mobile degree of freedom in there, which is sort of localized. It serves of like an interface between two different configurations in which these levers point into different directions, either to the right or the left. If you look at the orange ones, for instance, when this thing is in the middle, then they seem to be like pointing towards each other. Yeah, and then you can play beautiful games with these. And um, now what is interesting about this system is that it has a close counterpart again on the electronic side. You can go back to something a little bit earlier in the story when people in the late 70s um, studied these conjugated polymers, which are carbon chains um, with have double bonds and single bonds alternating, but there can be some defects in there. And they're like these rods which are pointing into different directions. So what they found is that this is actually confining electronic charges, but of a half of an electronic elementary charge without spin. And this thing can move, the, move freely through the structure if you just change this um, dimerization pattern. So, um, so these double bonds, they can be configured. You cannot get rid of it. So it's a really stable thing, um, which is due to the topology of these double bonds. And on top of this, again, you do it on top of the family system. OK, so this system is actually quite interesting because it's easy. And I guess most of, people, of you have seen it before. But uh, I just want to point out uh, three important features. Um, two of which are probably more familiar than the third one, but the third one is very, very transferable to other centers. So this is a system which has two different carbon atoms, and only these are really important for this story in the unit cell. So your block hematonium is a two by two matrix, um, but there is a symmetry, which is due to the fact that all the carbon atoms are chemically identical. And in the band structure, it translates into a symmetry of these bands. You have a two by two Hamiltonian, so you have two energy bands, but they're symmetric in energy. It's called the Kara symmetry, but this gives you the symmetry in the band structure. And now if you have a defect like two weak bonds coupling to each other, you get an extra state in the system. And by symmetry, this extra state, because it cannot have any symmetric partner in energy, it needs to sit at zero energy. Okay. So the energy of these states is robust. If you look at their wave functions, they are localized in space. Okay. So this is really something which is like tied to your defect. And the third property is that it lives on one subject zone. It sits in zero energy. Yes, that's what I expect. So at this symmetry protected position, there's no other way to put it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. if you have two, yeah. Yes, so it depends on how you do it. Um, there's certain springs of, of um, and if your hobby becomes so large that uh, these kind of things cannot be distinguished nicely, you get a huge fragmentization in something which has lots of defects, which looks like lots of Anderson localized states, which uh, of which lots of them actually have you know, close to zero energy, depending on how far the different uh, domains are. But um, depending on if you want to do it with the finite system, there's only one boundary condition system to to the zero mode, and then you will always have one exact one, which is strangely localized, delocalized over all these defects. <clears throat> so there's a lot of hybridization going on. It's a complicated story, but uh, this kind of symmetry would not be effective. Yeah. So whatever you do, you will always have this vector symmetry. Yeah, but the zero energy, the zero energy state would be uh, replaced if the disorder is not. Um, well, you would have to do it for a finite system. Then, then if you want to do it consistently, you have to determine the system at the red dots anyways. Otherwise, you also get edge states, which are hybridizing this defect state. And if you do it then in the disorder setting, you will still have only exactly one zero mode. You can prove it. It's a very simple. Way. 
but for that in this uh, intact mode or would it be exact? Okay. It would still be a zero energy, but its spatial structure would be completely different, and you can work it out with your recursion relation, multiplying the. So this becomes a bit technical, but you can then work out the range function of the of this um, thing. It will still be on one sub lattice only, and you can predict by just putting one amplitude here all the other amplitudes by just multiplying by the subsequent ratios of how and find that three that. Yeah. So can I modify the zero energy by saying if I apply some kind of potential on all the red, and then we'll, I can change. We will come to this now, which is very important, <laughs> but it's related to yeah the subletters. So very very good question. So this moves us nicely forward to the, the next point because I mean these two things. This is something that many people know, but the subletters. Um, Polarization, as we often call it, is actually quite interesting. And um, it's just actually on some level, it's just a sum rule. You have one extra state, you have one red dot more than blue dots in the system. So it, at some point, you somehow have to accommodate the weight, and this extra state is actually taking part of it. And uh, these things actually can be easily proven, but I don't want to show you or improves um, the statement is, I think, more important. Okay, so let's put on a second potential. So let's try easily just uh, putting two different values of potentials, just different between red and blue. And what it's uh, going to do is that the bands are going to move further. But the zero mode, because it's only on the red subletters, will only move into one direction. So it somehow breaks the symmetry. Now also in energy as a response of something external. So you see it in the physical response of the system. Okay. For instance, if that thing that effectively breaks or introduces this potential is some feature of your band structure tied to another wave number, this directly results in unidirectional transport. Uh, the part of your dispersion branch which is pointing only into one direction. So the group velocity is positive in this case, uh, but there is no counterpart flowing into the other. I have because in the previous case, the symmetric will take the closed curve from this. Yes. But in this case, symmetric is broken. Now we have broken the chiral symmetry, but of course you want to know what is, we start out from the situation with chiral symmetry, we ask what are the consequences. And breaking the symmetry at this point was very defined is actually the best way to do it. Because this is the way that you see an anomalous response of the system. Right. Now you can argue that there are other symmetries if you take the complete, uh, there are global symmetries which are still present of, uh, which are like have replaced the, the most of the other symmetry, but they're non symmetric and it's a complicated story. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so what we are going to do is for most of the rest of the talk, we're just thinking about photonic realizations of this anomalous response. Sorry, uh, the question yeah. is, is the, uh, so the state moves, uh, say, up in energy, mm -hmm. uh, is it still occupying strictly only one sub this or not anymore? It is still exactly on the would that be supposed to be the same? Um, you can see that if you start out and found the state in the case that it wasn't, there was, this potential wasn't there. Then yes. Then yes, then you can use that very exact wave function to see if it's still a solution. And you find that it will be still a solution. Why? Why? Because, um, because that particular state is the only one um, that, let's do it, let's, set this one to zero and just put something onto the blue side yeah, okay. first. Well, that state will not see anything of that. And so it will not be affected. That's the easiest way to think of it. Now, obviously, if you put something on top of the whole system to compensate for this, like an identity matrix is just going to move the spectrum rigidly on top of this. But you have to be a little bit careful, but anything that you just put onto the blue subnet is even if it is disordered, would 
would preserve the zero mode nature of this. Um, and I have many ideas of how one can actually exploit this, um, but um, we'll uh, uh, see the consequence of this in a different set of the data. Okay. So, short question the gene direction. This is the along the interface. Right. Now, this is sort of I artificially what I call delta replaced by, say, let's assume that it would be Z to illustrate that it is related to something that you already know from these topological systems and claim that they all use topological transport. You would have to come up with a different microscopic model in higher dimensions to get exactly this. Yeah, the, and there's not a long this yeah. uh, chain direction, but handy. Like that direction. would be sort of yeah, effectively a, a, yes. another direction. I don't know why I call it that direction. That's just the first one that came to my mind. Okay, so we are looking into photonic realizations. And the general idea is, first of all, that symmetries and dimensionality seem to dictate some robust properties, mm -hmm. which one can explain in piece of topology. So this is highly transferable to different systems. But different systems might have completely different features so that you need to revisit what you have done. Or some of your assumptions might break down or your phenomenology might completely change. And for photonic systems in particular, you can have gain and loss and nonlinearities. And then you can have constants. So we will see all of this. So I start out with an example, and this is how I really entered this whole field. Essentially 10 years ago, a friend of mine um, suggested to, to look at the SSH model. And um, I had studied some kind of systems which are known as PT symmetric systems. PT symmetric systems are very similar to those systems with two different entities like red and blue dots that you can map onto each other. And if you map them onto each other by a symmetry, what you do is to interchange gain and loss. So these were already intrinsically photonic systems, if you think about them, but they were introduced as an alternative to quantum mechanics. But um, the real world applications are all in photonic systems with gain and loss. But now, however, what happens that in a system like this one with this defect, this PT symmetry is actually broken. So you could think of a system where you make a reflection through the middle of the bond and you Met, um, discrete resonators with gain and loss maybe onto each other. But if you have this extra resonator, this is just not going to work. Um, so let's see what happens. Well, it's actually not so difficult to see what happens if you if you forget about the topology and then we try to reintroduce it again by, by understanding what the symmetries um, are. So what happens is, um, so how do we model this? Instead of having these delta and minus delta, we just put two different complex onsite potentials onto the system. Um, that makes the system non-hermitian and it produces a complex spectrum, but also wave functions which might not be orthogonal to each other. But in terms of the complex spectrum, well, what you will find is, um, okay, it happens that you still get two bands, especially if you just take opposite values for a long time, the bands will actually still remain real. <clears throat> and then you have this mid-gap state, and this has a different complex part of its, or uh, imaginary part of its electron. Okay. So what is happening without doing the calculation is that all the states which are in the bands, you can <laughs> prove that they have exactly the same weight on the two sublattices. There's another consequence of this original symmetry, and this is not going away if you put these on-site potentials onto it. So they will actually just see the average gain and loss that you put into the system. And think that you have some specific value of gamma A and gamma B for this to be satisfied. Because if I put one of them loss, then from your wave function, if you distribute for both uh, A and B, and both are loss, and basically you have to have the energy and the of the Yes, so what, uh, but that's not what I said. Uh, yeah, I, but I, I said, so I, I just said that they all have the same imaginary part. Okay, so they will then have exactly half of the gain at the loss that you put into. So you said there's no, say, loss on one half of the system, but loss on the other half of the system. 
and they will therefore see exactly this average values. <laughs> While gamma bar, no? yeah, which is gamma bar, gamma bar. exactly. Um, so they will all have the same oh, okay. the complex plane. It will be zero if you do what you just said, so that they have opposite values, which is some of the things that we were interested in doing this PT symmetry, but we don't need this. And then we have one state, and this has a different um, imaginary part. It translates into a different lifetime of this state. And you can now essentially freely tune this lifetime um, make the state more long living, which is higher up in the complex plane, or let it decay more quickly, which is lower in the complex plane, depending on how you will decide to, to put your gain and loss into this. Okay. And um, the mode, that particular mode, will still have the same mode profile as before. So what this means is this mid-gap state can be selectively amplified or suppressed because of this anomaly in its subject is polarization. Um, there is a symmetry behind this, and it's a symmetry with respect to the imaginary axis. Just to mention that briefly, so if you work this out, you can make a transformation that sends the Hamiltonian to the negative of its complex contract. And this symmetry is still preserved even with these complex on-site potentials, but it, because of this complex conjugation, you can only do it with these complex potentials. And so this is one state which is protected in the sense that it sits on the imaginary axis, but it doesn't need to have a partner, so this state is really special. So this is a microwave realization. I'm going to show you some experiments to illustrate this uh, mechanism two settings. So my friends in Nice, um, especially Ole and uh, Ole Kuhl and Fabrice Montesagne, together with Charles Foley, who was my postdoc, and Mathieu Belek, who actually did the experiments, I guess, at the time. Um, so then they bought these microwave resonators originally to build microwave. These are digital resonators which can be operated in the microwave range where in a certain frequency um, window, you actually excite just the fundamental mode, one of the, say, TE or TM modes in these resonators. And then they are coupled to each other by the venesian field. The coupling strength is just a function of the distance between these resonators. So what you do is just to ask them to set them out along a line where you alternate alternating the couplings until you go to the middle of the system and you have two white spacings, two weak couplings, and then you continue to the other side. You make it sure that the boundary conditions um, are compatible in the way that I described before. And now then they can put in this, for instance, into the system. Gain is a little bit more difficult, but losses by just putting some elastomer patches on top of every second resonator, which is the beat sum of this. Elastomer patches. Um, yeah, this is just some material. I only know the word. I don't know what is uh, its chemical, <laughs> but it's something which uh, apparently uh, mainly introduces losses, but uh, not so much. It has a small effect, as we will see in the graphs, on shifting also the real part of the energy. I think so. All this material was added to every second resonator. All of them were equivalent, or it was one by one. Uh, yeah. They were all identical, and it, 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 these are these four panels here, which tell you what happens at every step in building such a system. So, but how do you achieve that to the right and to the left? You have different, uh, you need different from one. Yeah. So here you just ask them to please put a little bit more space between the resonators. Ah, so it's not, I see. Yeah, it's really just asking them to do, and fortunately, yeah. they are, um, they, just follow it. They were interested enough in doing it. Let's say it like this. Okay. I think to introduce again, it's hard to introduce a loss for photonic user at metal on top. Yeah, we will see some, some other experiments. I'm running out of time, but <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm, I love the questions. 
Okay, so this is the system, but without the defects made out of 20 resonators, actual exponential results obtained by placing antennas in clever ways and changing the frequency by which you excite the system, picking up the signal. And what you get out of this is the density clusters. You can also get the local density of states, but here is the total density of states. You would expect um, 20 states, which are nicely grouped into two little intervals, which are the size quantized bands. Two bands, size quantized, and two bunches of 10 peaks. Why do we know asymmetric to the decision? Not pure. Obviously, this is an engineered system, and that's a very, very important aspect. Nothing in here is fundamental. In contrast to the electronic systems, which is what I actually want to explore in this is my research program to understand what this means. So this is certainly not ideal. All these peaks have different heights and widths and maybe different spectral weights even. Um, now, then they put one extra resonator into the middle and having this wider spacing around it. So it's like this system, but without the patches on top. Now you see that there is an additional mode, which is roughly in the center of this thing. That convinced me to say, that this is actually the same frequency as a single resonator, which is like zero for us. And it has some effect on the rest of the system, but in the case you have this peak. And then you put in these extra losses and you find that it broadens and even shifts also all these states. But this is something which is only happening on the sublattice where the zero mode is not living. It's actually breaking the symmetries also in some ways. In these experiments, it's unavoidable. But this flow does not move, and it actually maintains its spectral weight. So this is round about the same height, the same width as uh, as you find. Okay, so by putting losses into the system, you seem to filter out this mode. And you can uh, translate this into pulse propagation. If you want to excite the system already with the defect inside, but without the extra losses, you would already see guiding through this zero mode, but also a lot of speckle because you excite lots of um, other modes unavoidably because they have some overlap with the excitation and they have still finite lifetimes. But if you then suppress all these other modes in with this dedicated mechanism, you see nice propagation on the this zero. Okay, right. Um, you can build systems which have the sublattice polarization in many different other systems. For instance, on the leak lattice. Uh, I don't have a question. <laughs> so, what happens if you put the loss uh, on as a side but accept uh, the center? You mean everywhere, but not in, but but yes. not but not the one. Okay. But so you mean including at these others, at these sites. Yeah. You break the symmetries. You will set. You probably inherit a lot of the features because your original state was nicely localized. But it's more like a qualitative. Well, more like a, there's some kind of practical robustness of this mode because it's also spectrally isolated. You have to do something to the system before you lose some features. But you have a harder time to prove, to connect it to some topology. It's just more like an ordinary defect state. So you can achieve some things there, but it's not as nice. So this is sort of the ideal way, and it's guided by your insights on topology. Okay, the leaf lattice, <clears throat> same group of uh, friends, but now placing it in an interesting way, in a two-dimensional plane. The leaf lattice um, has Ideally, it would have this chiral <clears throat> symmetry because you can compose it into two sublattices again. And if you just look at the neighbors of the these A1 and A2 sites, they are all B sites. And this is what really guarantees you this um, chiral symmetry. But of course, in reality, you might also have some couplings, especially between these A sites because they're quite close to each other, but maybe not so much between the B sites because they're in the shadow of Okay, so that means that anything which is maybe only on the B sublattice would still have very nice features. But what you start out is with the system which actually has something special on the A sublattice. So what is this? Well, you have now a three by three matrix um, for your Bloch Hamiltonian, 
but you have two A sides in there, so there will always be a flat band. It will have this color symmetry. It has to have one state at zero. You can't go anywhere else. And if you work it out again, all this spectral weight will be on A side. But now practically, because of these additional couplings, you will find some corrugation. So this color symmetry isn't, uh, isn't perfect. But then if you look into the system, the way that it's being built, it has these wider spacings in the middle and some alternating distances. And then you work out that there is a zero mode. With this kind of um, boundary, it's actually an exact solution again, but it lives on the B sub lattice. And now actually this little bit of extra coupling between the A size helps to spectrally isolate it a little bit away from what was the okay. Why is it limited to the B size? Um, okay, this is a bit of one way to understand mm -hmm. it is by just counting. <laughs> type of number of resonators um, in this finer geometry with this particular... I mean, uh, it originated from the flat band, right? It, it originates from the Dirac cone. Uh -huh. So there are two more states in there. Okay. Yeah. It originates from the Dirac cone, but it becomes kind of back to the isolated. Mm -hmm. Do we need to make it uh, for both uh, generators or can you even if you just... Uh, both? Okay. You can also put it into the corner. No, I mean, you can use the same yeah. type of boundary say, produce it that it takes like modulation on the A X axis. Yeah, and we want to have it spectrally isolated. Um, so by putting in these different couplings, you actually first get out the debug cone, but there will still be, if you count it exactly, the, that already gives you a zero mode, which is degenerate. Um, there's one additional site which has some. There's an additional weight on the IA sharp lattice and one on the B sub lattice. But then this becomes uh, well, it's a, it's a longer story. But um, the nice thing is, you see this again in the experiments. But if, if it originates from this uh, intersection point, then why do you need the deep layers altogether? Just take the honeycomb layers. Will it work there as well? Um, it looks like the nature sure, of extension sure. of your SSH uh, yeah. Uh, feature. Yeah, it, it might. I mean, there are many different models one can look at. We just decided to look at this. Um, yeah, it could be also even just um, a square lattice with some clever Z2 type of fluxes. Um, there are different ways to get defects um, in there. But it's just one of where we have done. But um, I have not really looked into the details of this system. Okay, so in the experiments, you get um, now you can also measure the local density of states. So the flat band nicely, well, it spreads out because of this residual couplings of an interval. And next to it, if you look into the density of states, you can have the zero mode. You can put this defect into different places actually in the system. Um, but then if you put in the losses, you find that the zero mode here on the B sub lattice becomes comes on very nicely. Well, if you put the losses only onto the A sub lattice, so complementary to the to say that you want to see. Um, so you can then play okay. Now, without this gain and loss, I just wanted to mention you can build these things, similar things also in more complicated systems, such mm -hmm. as uh, exciton polariton systems. So this is something that we did with the group in Sheffield. Um, and there you can actually see some things like compact points. So compact states, which I know interests lots of people in here, only that in here you have some extra degrees of freedom. So in these polaritonic systems, you can also excite higher modes, like um, things which look like P orbitals in them. And on top of this, you have this TETM polarization that you cannot distinguish anymore in contrast to what people do in these uh, microwave resonators. So you have a more complicated situation, but um, if you pump these systems very strongly, these patterns come, become very nice. So you see these compact configurations in some frequency interval, which have these nice lobes, and they point it to different directions, um, giving you a nice coupling configuration. 
so that um, they always face each other so that you have weak couplings to the neighbors in this case. And on top of this, I don't know if I have this here, you can then look at the optical polarization and you see how some of these features translate to other degrees of freedom. So you can enrich these systems with other degrees of freedom and then it's the same. So you have some effective spin orbit coupling if you avoid by looking at these. So how are you going to define spin here? There, is, um, there are two types of spin in these systems. One which looks effectively if you write down your equations just for the photonic degrees of freedom because there is a discrete structure from this um, TE, TM mode um, configuration. But there's also a true electronic spin in these systems, which can be useful if you want to probe the systems. So, so the uh, electron impact comes from the exciton? From the electrons. From, well, inside the exciton, polariton, you have a photonic and the electron. Okay. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> This is just more of the same. So this is just the same for a graphene system, um, which is a graphene system. So it's not that we not never looked at graphene systems, but we actually strained them in a way so that you get Landau levels. But maybe you ask me questions about it uh, later, just to get towards a natural conclusion of this talk, um, which leaves out lots of other things in our um, So. Let's do two things. I briefly tell you something about topological lasers, and then I tell you something briefly about the actual physical limits because I advertise them. <laughs> okay, so yeah. At some point, then people actually moved on to really build lasers based on these concepts. And um, Yang Feng uh, was kind enough to do this collaboratively. So what he did is to build these ring resonators. Again, you can have them spaced out in different ways. And they just built a system out of nine resonators. And now they put chromium on top of every second resonator to introduce losses. And then just pump the whole system. It's some kind of heterostructure in which you can pump the system. And I don't even know whether it's electronic or optical, but maybe it's, it's done optically. Okay, now if you build a system without this chromium on top of it, it's uh, it essentially, you have a lot of disorder. All these resonators will have slightly different properties. And it's a strongly nonlinear system with a lot of competition of where you can put the energy into. And at some point, this thing starts to laze. But basically, as if you have lots of independent components. And you see this in the spectrum because you get lots of different peaks. And now, if you force the system to behave so that the only thing that really produces some kind of mathematical solution, um, something kind of consistent in the interplay between the system, including the losses, then you force the system to still produce radiation across, say, five of these four resonators, but this all is actually one point, which you see immediately in the spectrum. So you see that this is basically forced to become a single mode laser with just a much increased weight. And here this goes up to, say, well, let's say close to 500, and here it goes up to a bit over 1,000. There was a lot of activity on so called uh, random lasers or disorder. Yeah. Is that somehow? Can you comment briefly on that? This is um, um, things that people looked at. Roughly similar people or the same people looked at even 10 years earlier, like Hui Chao, for instance. And before that, there was Art uh, Lachendijk and these people, they looked at this a lot. Um, one of the goals was to produce Anderson localization of light. And there was a huge debate on whether they achieved it or not. And I know that this debate went through different uh, phases, um, swinging forward and backward. And I don't know what the final is. So, yeah. But, uh, at some point, people thought they had disproven that there can be Anderson localization. 
think there are more recent experiments that I didn't follow. Okay. Um, so again, yeah. in, in the previous slide, that the single peak, uh, I added some uh, loss contribution. Uh, it, it, it depends what extent it uh, depends on uh, some, some magnitude of the loss. Right? I mean, okay. So what they investigated, they couldn't build so many different structures. And this was a microwave experiment. I can show you some other graphs where uh, Fabrice and Ulder and Co. They all did even artificial disorder into the system and see how robust it was. Um, uh, this this robot was robust in terms of its frequency. And only the wave functions changed a little bit, but in basically completely consistent with what we would expect. Now here you can't build so many structures, but once you have a structure, you can increase the gain. And I have some transparency somewhere where it shows that um, in this configuration, it has a really nice, well-behaved laser threshold, which does a single slope, no complications in the slope efficiency is well defined. So other signatures that you can call it a laser. And it's nature communications. When you submit a paper to nature communications or the whole nature group and call something laser, you have a checklist. For instance, if you have a finite threshold and, and all these kind of things, and you could basically, it's not required to think everything because there are also threshold lists. But the more of those things you can tick, the better. And we could basically take more. So, yes, and that sense. Okay. Now, I was asked 45 minutes, but does it include all the intermediate questions? You can take more time. Uh, okay. 15 if I minutes, aim to okay. finish towards the hour, oh. yeah, that's okay. yeah, yeah. I can certainly do. Okay. Because I think I can give you the flavor of the complications. Yeah, that is actually coming here. So, what are the complications from gain and loss? <clears throat> um, you have finite lifetimes. You actually have also an enhanced sensitivity of your system. And um, altogether, this, these are two aspects of the same equation or the same phenomenon, namely that your system is not average. These finite lifetimes have something to do. I don't know whether actually I didn't write this here. This is coming from the complex eigenvalues. And this is coming from the non orthogonal modes. So both things, and this is even before you think about nonlinearity. You can do or quantitative. So, just because it's actually not so complicated, where does this come from? Well, if you have a mission operator, you know in a certain basis that needs to be kind of built into what you understand uh, your particular system to be about. The electric elements have this property of transposition being equivalent to complex conjugation. And then you get real eigenvalues, orthogonal eigenstates, and you can diagonalize these systems essentially always with a unitary matrix. And our systems are all finite, so Hermitian or self adjoint doesn't make sense. So a non Hermitian operator is simply violating this property, which means that the eigenvalues can be complex and the eigenvectors don't need to be orthogonal to each other. There are even non Hermitian some metrics that can have a real eigenvalue. Uh, absolutely. Roman condition. Yeah, that's why I said uh, can be complex, uh -huh. so don't need to be complex. Um, and uh, but are not orthogonal, you can probably also <laughs> write can. <laughs> you cannot would be wrong, right? <laughs> may not be orthogonal to each other. Okay. And you have to distinguish then actually what is called the right and the left eye vectors. There is, if your system is still symmetric, but these would still be connected to each other nicely, but that's related to another physical property, which is called reciprocity. It's quite important, the optics. So just having a symmetric matrix can also guarantee some light nice switches. Um, you can then do some mathematics. You can tie these right and left eigenvectors together in a certain way. Um, but even this doesn't work all the time because if you have degeneracies, you can't do this. You know. So 
in, in pictures, if you have a emission system, you have these right and left eigenvectors, but essentially you can say they are the same and they are orthogonal to each other. But in a non hermitian system, they become non orthogonal to each other. And indeed, the left eigenvectors, like this vector here, has to be orthogonal to this one here. This one has to be orthogonal to this one here. But if you say that, insist, for instance, that these are normalized, these will have to be longer because they have to have a unit protection, a projection onto the, onto the vector with the same. So this is this construction. So you can actually identify a certain number in here, like the length of these vectors. Uh, you can write it even in a way that it doesn't depend on any kind of normalization. Any choice gives you the same number. And um, this is called the condition number. It's uh, one if you have this kind of situation. And this shows up immediately in perturbation theory. So if you do perturbation theory in the Hermitian case, you know you calculate a matrix element of your perturbation, and this gives you the first order. But if you do this in the non-Hermitian case, you actually have to use these left and right eigenvectors, and if you just make an order of magnitude estimate of what this does to your shifts, it will multiply them by these conditions. So this is just a summary of the mathematics behind this sensitivity. Okay, now this becomes extreme when you have a degeneracy because in this non-emission degeneracies, not only eigenvalues, but also eigenvectors become the same. And if you want to keep this one here orthogonal to this vector, but having a unit protection on, protection on this one, this is like a contradiction, right? Uh, you can't have it orthogonal to a vector, but having some finite conformity of this direction. But that is what you want to have if these two vectors are the same. So as you approach this limit, this, uh, this condition number actually emerges. Okay. So now you see this actually in lots of different physical <laughs> um, Yeah, I will prepare lots of different things. Um, Okay, let me see if I have, okay, right. This will be much better. So you can have a system in which you, um, look, let's look at an optical system. And um, as soon as we pump the system, we want to make it into a system that spontaneously or even in an amplified way regulates um, but on its own radiation, this looks like a system in which light is coming out without sending anything. So you need to con break a conservation law, which means you have to make the system non -hermitian. And then the, the signatures that you find out is radiation coming out at certain frequencies. And these frequencies, the real parts tell you something about something which is yeah, your, the modes that you calculate. Um, the real pass of the frequencies and the width tell you something about the measurements. Okay. So this is typical resonance theory. There is some kind of operator behind this story with the complex spectrum and you can read off the width and uh, position of your resonances. But if your system is very non hermitian you start to feel this more non-orthogonality and there's an extra factor. So this width will be multiplied by these condition numbers. And in this context, this condition number is called the theta factor. Okay. And now you have a problem. A problem as a physicist, because in physics, nothing can ever diverge, right? So the question is, what happens if you have two of these resonances and their two frequency become the same? not in terms of just the real part, but in the complex plane, these two, what are like poles of the scattering matrix, they actually move to the same position. This condition number would diverge. Well, this cannot happen in terms, well, this can happen mathematically, but your radiation, for instance, it cannot diverge, or it cannot be infinitely broadband or something like this. Instead, what's happening is actually this Peterman factor increases, but at the degeneracy, 
these two modes actually combine, but your output frequency, uh, output intensity really remains finite. It's only that this is no longer a Lorentzian. It has a different shape. If you wanted to approximate this shape by Lorentzian, you would have to deal with infinite numbers, but the shape is simply different. It's the square of Lorentz. Okay. So this is one place where this appears. Now, this is actually a way where you see, where does the finite line width come from in the first place? It comes from quantum noise. It comes from the processes that create your photons spontaneously. And then they become amplified coherently. But before you get to this amplification process, you first have to have one photon that you created spontaneously. And when some photons have left the system, you need to create some others. So there's a constant uh, production of these incoherent photons. And essentially, the relative number tells you how broad this is by some kind of uncertainty principle. But now we see that in a non Hermitian system, this will be enhanced, or it even just changes completely the type of radiation that you get out of this. Okay. And this actually has also been observed now, but not, uh, I was not involved in this, but it has been observed uh, about a year ago in a group at NTT. Thank you. And um, there I can finish. So I'm not going to tell you anything about the non reciprocity, which makes it much more complicated but leads to essentially directed amplification. <laughs> but you can actually analyze the system in almost the same way as you analyze these lasers and you find that the Peter method are basically. So this is maybe just enticing discussions. I'm really grateful for all the questions that you ask. It's much better than telling you something in vacuum. So let me just summarize, well, but certainly not jump over this. But to thank lots of people with whom I'm collaborating, especially also on lots of experiments. Um, too many to go through name by name. But if I wanted to summarize what we have in here is that if you translate topological concepts to a different platform, First of all, you're happy that you see some similar effects, but then you quickly discover that the systems not have other features. Some features are not so nice. It's not so easy to build systems which have the exact symmetries that you need. But then there are other things which actually enhance the richness of the physics. And for photonic systems, gain and loss does this in multiple ways, including that um, you can manipulate states also in terms of their lifetime. And you can exploit the same kind of wave function features and distributions in real space as you have already in the electronic systems to do so. But um, also you see that this model on orthogonality, for instance, appears that these um, signatures in the quantum noise. And um, indeed, it helps you to actually also do sensors, even classical sensors, where right? the same mathematics appears and something apparently diverges. But in this case, it actually means a transition to some directed something. And um, I'm not talking about it today, but even in passive systems, you can have constraints that you don't expect. For instance, just by the the, the mere fact that if you send something into a system, in a passive system, nothing can come out on its own before you send something. So causality, for instance, is a, is a very nice feature in passive systems. So systems including losses, but not active. Nothing that produces radiation on its own. And um, I hope I managed to explain it. This picture <clears throat> sufficiently, and all the other things you can ask me questions about at any time. So thank you for your interest. Thank you, Henning, for this very nice and inspiring talk. I think we still have time for some questions. Yes. About well, this, the main message again, and Lawson, uh, is uh, can you give some simple physical explanation, especially with respect? This nice picture which you presented when you have 
a little bit of disordered system, you have a lot of peaks, you introduce uh, imaginary part and you have perfect lasers. Yeah. What is the physics? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a filter. It's a filtering effect. It filters out all the modes that you don't want and leaves only one mode. And it works well even in situations which are not ideal because on top of this, you manage to build a system in which this mode, in the ideal case, is spectrally well isolated. So there, there, there are two levels to it. On the level that your system is ideal, you simply suppress all the modes. So if you, then it doesn't depend on which way you excite your system, only the weight that went into the mode that you were interested in will live for a long time, like the, the, the actual physics of it, um, it's, it's going to dominate it by this one. If your system is not ideal, you have like some practical advantages, mainly say if you just think about perturbation theory, irrespective of what your system is, large level spacing has helped to suppress any, any mixing with other modes, which are, um, so if all the other modes are very partly tuned in frequency, which you achieve here sort of by starting from the ideal situation, there's quite a bit of a margin so that the system still work practically. In a sense, it's possible to think that you are uh, uh, that you are multiplying all unwanted places by e to the power minus because of this imaginary part. Indeed, right? yeah. So, and that's actually a very good question because most of the time we we uh, tune into thinking about the spectrum, right? Which means we think about stationary frequencies. Um, and obviously, behind all of this, there is a time vision. And often, well, we just want to make our life simple, right? But, um, but once you have these non emission effects, it's actually sometimes better to go back to the time evolution to see much more clearly what is going to happen. Because you directly see how certain processes become suppressed. You even understand that if you have nonlinearities, a lot of these things makes it survive because you can rescue some of the symmetries. Well, once you have a nonlinear system, talking about the spectrum does make sense. But you can still talk about symmetry protected time evolution. So you have one trajectory, another trajectory which is mapped onto it by the symmetry, and then you have trajectories that are mapped onto itself for all time. <clears throat> The symmetries that I talked to you about, they actually survive even in if you have a nonlinear system, as long as the nonlinearities are only in the gain and the loss, which is really the practical situation. So, yeah, there's a very good point. So, in, in some sense, the only thing which survives mm -hmm. uh, its uh, suppressive factor is, is, is yeah. it appears. Yeah. Yeah. For the, okay. yeah, so it's a lot of this is like the classical mode competition for this, but you manage to tune the mode competition in favor of one state, and you can still define this even taking the nonlinearities into account, which are essential to stabilize your system, so the material separation, so that you get a stationary mode at the end. Yes. Okay, more questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm not sure if, 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 if the, it is the clear question, but that uh, uh, this uh, gain and loss effect uh, uh, during this the filter process, the, uh, what's the effect on the coherence? Uh, well, this, this what I told you here is essentially a question of coherence. Uh -huh. And you see that non hermeticity generally is, is, has a detrimental, a bad effect on coherence. It, why it broadens laser lines. And um, people found it very hard to measure this actually because. But broaden compared to what? To an ideal system, which the only broadening is coming from what the, the, you go to the quantum limit of the system. That means a practical laser has a broad, much broader line width than the quantum limit because it operates at a finite temperature and it is inhomogeneous. So it has homogeneous and inhomogeneous line broadening on top of what you get from the quantum noise. But if we go to the quantum noise, then the hermeticity on top of this broadens the light width and even introduce a number which in principle can diverge. Um, now the, 
this experiment at NTT actually just worked slightly below the label threshold. This was very clever. <laughs> so that uh, you can actually see these things in amplified um, spontaneous circulation. But, uh, yeah. One, you had a question? Uh, yeah. I think uh, we can understand that since 15 has not been done since it can, can be understood by the non automatic mass mentally. Yeah. How can you understand its phenomenal digital? Physically, in the sense, what the laser physicists tell you, it is because a noisy photon has a finite overlap with other modes. So if it's a noisy, normally in an ideal laser, so I, I don't know whether this helps. Um, in quantum optics, especially, you can obtain, you can describe, you can get this Gitterman factor out of four or five different formulas in all suggest different ways, okay? But uh, one formalism would basically evaluate how much noise in your system by looking at the spontaneous, this the noisy photon in every in every vacuum mode. So on some level, every vacuum mode has exactly one noisy photon, which is exactly what Einstein used in order to work out the A and B conditions. Okay. So it's a, like a, a hand waving thing, but it worked perfectly to calculate these A and B conditions. But now you have a, a noisy photon in the in the mode, which has some finite overlap with your laser. Before, in the ideal system, the resonators with very high, um, very low transparency confinement by very less leaky, but very good mirrors. Okay, so great mirrors, a, a very good cavity. All these modes are essentially. Uh, orthogonal to each other. And if there's a noisy photon in the vacuum, it's some mode that is not lazing, you don't care about it. But it has some finite overlap with the modes that you actually care about, especially the lazing mode. It seems that there's no that there's more noise in the system. And so that comes out by working out the matrix elements in some kind of quantum functional equation. Okay, more questions? Yes, please. So uh, you have this. Uh... Imaginary uh, interface state. Yes. And uh, this is due to the gain loss in the uh, chain in the left and right. Mm -hmm. So, I, can you comment on if you change the gain, at, gain and loss at the boundary of this chain? Okay. How that will affect this uh, Very little because it has, because it's also declining exponentially. <laughs> so, there are lots of features which are obviously good. So and actually, this this helps a lot um, in making what much of these experiments also rely on this effect. So I mentioned the modes are spectri isolated. This helps. Their local exponential envelope means also that if there is noise, it's really only sensitive to the local noise around the defect. But if you do something very far away, obviously mathematically it's going to shift it, but um, well, decaying exponentially with this as a way. Center. Mm -hmm. and, um, then, if you have a disordered system, like Anderson optimization, like I have say in basketball, obviously it becomes very, very complicated. The competition between how much disorder and how you distribute it over your system. Okay, more questions? Yes, please. Someone? So, the title was the uh, Physical limitation of the non unchain non designated okay. yes, um, devices. So, can you summarize or some representative uh, devices and then um, limitation of the involving this factor? And okay, yes. you almost yeah. invite me to give another talk, right? <laughs> you realize that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but, uh, okay, but that's completely my fault. You know, that's uh, my preparation of this. I'm giving it a title. <laughs> Uh, so the so this is certainly the, one of the key key aspects um, of the limitation is this non hermeticity makes your systems more sensitive, and this is whenever especially you have systems with gain inside because it for instance already starts to couple to your quantum noise. On top of this, what you really want to build in these settings would be lasers. So in these lasers, this has a consequence on the binding. So this is one limitation, and it's a very fundamental limitation. Well, this one here, which I didn't talk about at all, this causality, 
is um, is coming out. There are some effects which are people people want to see nowadays in these non hamiltonian systems. If you also break reciprocity, now gain and loss doesn't break reciprocity. Something like magneto optical effects would break with reciprocity, and if you do it in a non hamiltonian way, then it's actually direct decoupling. So um, now you can ask. The question, what kind of system do you need in order to see this? And then if you say, I want to build it in a passive system, I, you can work things out and you just don't see it at all. So this directed couplings, if you look at the density of states, turns out to be exactly that combination of right and left eigenmodes so that you don't see the distortion or the direct couplings anymore. So there's a limitation in seeing directed effects in passive systems, even if they're non-reciprocal. Um, the, um, the systems that people discuss in this context are essentially like SSH chains, only that you make couplings, uh, give couplings different values for different directions. But they have been built in active systems, and this was one of the videos that I jumped across, but you saw it very briefly, and thank you very much where people build a mechanical system, which look uh, in a very nice way. Um, show this, and I need to start this so I can pull on more back forward. You see this? This is a very representative non-reciprocal system built out of electronic components that measure certain positions of these levers and then exert additional forces on neighbors so that it translates into a non-symmetric dynamic. And my question here was, what is actually the physical signature of this? So the people who did this, they said, okay, these are the beautifully distorted right eigenmodes, but the left eigenmodes don't have any significance. But essentially, if you move your finger to one side or the other side, your response will change. And this is actually mapping out the left eigenmodes of your system. So if you mention, manage to get a right eigenmode, which is distorted into this direction, and the left eigenmode of the same eigenvalue, sort of into the opposite direction, you get directed amplification. So this is another physical consequence, which is now tied to So this is a number of examples, including some that I didn't really discuss so much, where you see this interplay of physical opportunities. And okay, uh, hmm. are there any more important questions? Everybody uh, wants to eat. It doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we have uh, food that should be prepared outside at some point. And uh, Henning was giving us uh, a very lazing lecture with uh, lots of uh, slides which were suppressed in the favor of other slides which were enhanced, like in the laser. So, but he's with us here until the end of March. So, uh, feel free to talk to him and uh, to check for all the interesting things which you didn't have time to talk today to us. So thanks very much, Henning. Thank you. Thank you.